Hey, thanks for checking out this sermon. It's designed to help you take your next step with Jesus. And if you haven't been able to make it to one of our campuses and participate in the time of giving, you could do so online through our website or by texting to give so that you can continue to participate in the mission that God has given us. We hope that God speaks to you through this sermon. causes fights and quarrels among you. On all of our campuses, those watching online and our friends inside the incarcerated church, what causes, what's the origin of the fights, quarrels, arguments among you? This is the question that James poses in the very first verse of chapter four. And uh, I'd encourage you to go ahead and turn your Bibles or your Bible apps there now. James chapter four, verse one. And as you get there, I have a question for everyone. How many of you also have a propensity to fight. And not like MMA fighting. Like if that's you and you have an issue with what I have to say today, after service, just sit in your chair and pray and give me enough time to leave and go home so that we don't have any issues. But but no, not like a propensity for fist fighting, but like you, you really enjoy arguing and disagreeing with people. You, you actually find yourself in these tense situations often because of relational conflict. If that's you, then you and I have a lot in common. I, I, I argue a lot. I get in a lot of verbal quarrels, especially with those I'm around the most. And growing up, I, I quarreled and fought so often that it actually caused my parents to fight. Uh, A few years ago, my dad told me that the most difficult thing in his marriage was me, (laughs) which which was super encouraging. You see, I I consistently get in fights with friends. Like any opportunity I get to point out how wrong one of my friends is, I am quick to speak and slow to listen. And my wife and I argue about things, uh, probably about the average amount for a married couple, maybe a little more. But, But the other day we had a big argument because I I didn't do the dishes. Now, Amanda loves when I just leave all the dishes in the sink, so I try to spoil her with that as much as possible. And and last time I did, it caused an argument, and to be honest, it was an argument that I just wanted to win. I was completely wrong, but I wanted to win that argument. See, through, yeah, good luck, thank you, I appreciate that. It sounded like you are really rooting for me. Uh, (laughs) Throughout my life, Throughout my life, I've realized something that, that kind of cuts to the core of me in light of this, that I'm not, I'm not gonna shy away from an argument, but, I, but I've realized, I've begun to understand that those I love the most are also the people I tend to hurt the worst. You see, I, I think most of us can agree that this is true of any relational conflict we experience, that the people we love the most are also the people we hurt the worst. And maybe you're not like me. Maybe you don't necessarily love arguing. Maybe you're not as aggressive as I am. Maybe you're more passive aggressive. Maybe you bottle everything in until you can't contain it anymore and then you explode. Maybe you do whatever you can to avoid conflict and just hold on to your resentment toward people without them knowing. Maybe you're extremely defensive and maybe, maybe you're quick to blame other people for any issue that arises in your life. I'm also guilty of this and I'm sure it's just me, no one else does this, but I often think it is other people's fault for my problems or any relational conflict I experience. I do this at work, I do this at home, and I definitely do this when I drive. Because if everyone would just drive like me, there wouldn't be any traffic anymore. 
Amen? Yeah. You're saying that for me, not for you, right? Yeah. Does, does, anyone, does anyone else ever experience anything where they're like, you know what? Any issue I face, it's rarely my fault. See, when I cut someone off or drive too fast or too slow or when someone doesn't like how I respond in an email or is upset by something I say or do or doesn't like when I don't do the dishes, it is definitely not my fault. It's theirs. Anyone else with me on this? That's awesome that you just raised your husband's hand. That is fantastic. <laughs> Have a good afternoon. Uh, you know, I've noticed that in every quarrel, fight, and argument I find myself in, there is one constant, one thing that is consistently present in the equation. Me. And look at what James says in the rest of verse one. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Here's what James is saying to the early church, and I think this is so applicable to us today. When it comes to your, your arguments and fights and quarrels and disagreements, the cause, the origin, the foundation of the fights, James says, it's not, the problem is not from among you. It's from what's within you. If we, if we lived in the South, then this you, this first you would probably be like a y'all. The problem isn't among y'all. It's from, I don't even sound right saying that. It's from what's within you, as in like you as an individual person, making it very clear that the issue, the thing that causes the argument or fight can and most likely does derive from something within each of us. The conflict is internal, and this is so difficult for us to acknowledge because as soon as I realize that I might be part of the problem and I admit that there is something wrong in me, guess what happens? I lose all my leverage. It's difficult to win an argument when I admit that I'm wrong. James continues. You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You desire, you long for, you set your heart on something so much that, that you will kill and destroy and run through others to get it. You, you covet, and the word covet that James uses here is the Greek word zeleu. And this word in the Greek is an onomatopoeia, which if you know what that is, it's a word that gets its origin from the sound that it makes. Think like sizzle or grunt or meow. Those are other examples. And the, the sound that this word is associated with is the bubbling of boiling water. How many of you are trying to figure out how that sounds like bubbling of boiling water? Yeah, yeah, nice. I see you. Uh, but but here's, here's what this context is. Something, something that... that something that is so hot that it bubbles over. And within this context, it means to burn with zeal or to be completely intent upon, to desire with great enthusiasm. As human beings, this is what James is saying, that we, are, we, we, we have this desire with a boiling zeal. We have this desire for this one thing. We desire to get our way. We want our way. And I'm sure we can, we can internalize this a little bit and maybe figure out what this means for us. Think with me, what happens in your heart, in your mind, and in your soul anytime you don't get your way? And now take a moment and think of what you've done to other people just to get your way. Have relationships ever been damaged or maybe even destroyed? Have people been left out? Have others been marginalized? Have you disregarded the needs or desires of other people so that you can get your way? The best word I can think of to describe this is the word appetite. And, and what do we do when we have an appetite for something? We will do whatever it takes to satisfy that appetite. I mean, it wouldn't be called an appetite if it was satisfied. How many of you have ever eaten so much in your life that you've said, I'm never going to eat again? And where do you find yourself 20 minutes later? You got your head in the fridge. Like, what else, what else can I eat? What else? My wife did this when she was pregnant with our son. Uh, she, she would go to the McDonald's drive-thru uh, and because she loved McDonald's french fries for some reason, and she would, not for some reason, let's be honest, they're delicious, but, 
She would go through the, the drive-thru and get french fries, and before she'd leave the parking lot, she would just circle right back into the drive-thru <laughs> and order more french fries. It was, a, it was a game she played with herself, I think, and it cost us a lot of money, but... But it's not just her, right? Like I do this every Thanksgiving when there are leftovers. Like I eat so much and then all of a sudden 30 minutes after dinner's over, I'm like, you know what? Turkey sandwich sounds great right about now. Now why, why do we do this? Because none of us, no one in this room, no one watching online, no, no one in any of our other venues has ever gotten full and stayed that way. You don't get full and stay full. And for me, this goes way beyond my appetite for food. My appetite for getting my way is consistently present. And I will admit that when I don't get my way, when that appetite isn't satisfied, I am quick to blame someone else when I'm not happy, when I'm dissatisfied, or when I don't get what I want. It is often someone else's fault. And I'm guessing that each of us can think of someone right now who we have blamed for our dissatisfaction in life. They're not who or what we thought they would be. They don't think or act the way we thought they should. They don't do things our way. Maybe there's someone you're still blaming for your dissatisfaction in life. So I have a question for all of us today, just before we even really dig in. Who in your life feels like it is their fault that you are dissatisfied? For your shortcomings, for your sin, for your status, for your salary, for your loneliness, for your whatever your dissatisfaction is. You know, maybe a great next step for us today is to admit to that person, hey, my problem with you is not all on you. Part of it is that it's a battle within me that I have difficulty controlling. I'm not getting my way and I'm blaming you. James, James tells the early church, and I think this is applicable as, as well, why, why this is such a struggle. He says, you do not have, end of verse two, you do not have because you do not ask God. You do not have because you do not ask God. See, our, our heavenly father is the source of everything we, ne we need and also he's the source of everything we're ever going to get. If that is a struggle for us, then we've probably never invited God into the equation when it comes to some of our relational conflicts. I mean, what did James say in chapter one, verse 17 of this, of his writing. He said, every good and perfect gift is from my spouse. No, that's not right. <laughs> from my friend, no. From, from my parents, no. From, from myself, yeah, no. What does James say? Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. You know, maybe we've forgotten who the source of everything ultimately is. So in those moments where we are tempted to blame others when we don't get our way, what if instead we stopped and came before God and said, hey God, I'm lonely. God, I'm dissatisfied. God, I should have gotten the raise. God, my parents are crazy. I see a lot of crazy parents out there based on that laughter. God, God, my spouse isn't, whatever, whatever it is. What if we took that stuff before God? If we said, God, I'm not getting my way, but I know, I'm fully aware that you're the source. I know that everything that is good comes from you. So I'm not gonna blame other people anymore, but instead I'm bringing it to you. You, Father, are the source of every good thing. We do not have because we do not ask God. Most likely, we didn't even think to ask God for his provision or his timing or his peace or his clarity in whatever relational conflict we're dealing with in the first place. And, and maybe you did. And, and maybe, maybe you did come to God and you brought it before God, but let's, let's do a quick heart check on this. And this is helpful in any situation we find ourselves in. What was your motivation in asking for God's provision? Was it in line with what God desires for your life and for the life of those around you? Or was your happiness and satisfaction tied closely to that? Look at verse three. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Sometimes God says no. And in those confusing, bewildering times in our life, it would be good to take a step back and try and discover our motivation for asking. 
It's like when my son comes home from school and he asks for very specific snacks after school. Sometimes I say yes, sometimes I say no. When Jericho says, Dad, can I have Oreos and ice cream for snack today? I often say no. And every time, without fail, as soon as I say no, Jericho looks at me and says, but Dad, I'm so hungry. It's, it's so accusatory, like it's my fault that he's hungry. But instead of saying, like, too bad, you're gonna starve, what do I say? I say, Jericho, let me help you with that. Let's find something good for you. Let's get you some fruit and let's get you some vegetables, something that will be healthy for you. Th think about this with me. What if every time God said no, instead of getting upset or blaming someone else when we don't get our way, what if we postured ourselves before God and told our Father, the source of everything good, hey, God, since you said no, will you help me with that? See, do we trust that God communicates to and provides for us at least, at least as much as I do for my son? Let's ask ourselves when we don't get our way, and this is so important, a question I hope we can hold on today. Do we want to be in control or will we submit to God's way? Will we submit to the goodness of God? Now, right after James says this, if we keep reading, there's something that, that, he, that he does that kind of, it's kind of jarring, but after he, he gets done kind of getting on them about the fights and quarrels, he, he calls them a name. He says, beginning of verse four, you adulterous people. And we have to understand, he's not talking about sexual unfaithfulness. It's not like he was talking about quarreling and now he's like, all right, that's done. We're gonna talk about something else. No, he's referring to their spiritual unfaithfulness. James says, hey, church, you are cheating on God. You're cheating on God's way. And you're, and you're doing it by choosing your way. See, throughout the 17 verses of this chapter, James applies the same logic to their pride, to their slander, and to their arrogance. He's like, you guys are doing all these things, and it's causing all these quarrels and fights, and you're judging, and you're boastful, and the reason why is because you are in love with, you are consumed with, you are captured by your way, not God's way. He even goes as far as to call them double-minded in verse eight. And this is so interesting, this word that he uses here. He's actually the only author in the entirety of the books that make up the New Testament that uses this phrase. And it is the Greek word word daisukos. He uses it once in James chapter one and again here in James chapter two. And I wanna break this word down for us real quick. Because if we take a closer look at it, di means two, sukos or psychos, which is generally things that we, we, we generally understood as things that have to do with the mind, right, psych. So, so that's where we get the double-mindedness. But a closer study into the Greek, we learned that to the Greeks, sukos more had to do with a person's soul than it did their mind. So what James is saying is that you are two-souled. You're two-souled. You're split in half. But if we keep reading, we see that in, in, in verse five, God jealously longs for our spirit. He longs for our soul. And I don't think God longs for half of it. I don't think he's like, you know what? You keep some, I'll keep the rest. See, I believe that God jealously longs for our entire soul. And James is saying, you aren't living the life that God desires for you. So what do we do with all this? James is telling the early church to stop quarreling and fighting, to not be proud, to not talk bad about others, to not be boastful or, 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 or arrogant, to eliminate the re relational conflict that is among you as a church. He says, this is what's causing all the conflict interpersonally. He even resorts to a bit of deserved name calling. But then if you look at the beginning or at the middle of this text, verse seven, right smack dab in the middle, the quarreling verses are verses one through three. The, the, the pride verses are four through six. 11 through 12 is slander. 13 through 17 is, is boasting and arrogance. Right in the middle, verse seven, he gives the how. He says, Here, here's what James writes. Submit Fun word in our culture. Submit yourselves then to God. Submit yourselves. Not being split sold. Not cheating on God with yourself. Choosing God's way over your way. This is submission. And if, if, if you guys, if you've been following with us throughout this series, you've realized that as we study James, the brother of Jesus, that he pretty much just 
takes what his brother says and reiterates it in a different way. And this is part of it. I mean, this is such a consistent theme throughout Jesus' teaching that it is no wonder Jesus' brother is reiterating the central idea from the life of Christ. I mean, just if you've been around church for a while, just think about some of the things Christ has said. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Or whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Theologian Miroslav Volf had an interesting take on Jesus' words and this theme from Jesus' life. He said, we have a wrongly centered self that needs to be decentered by being nailed to the cross. Ideally, in our relationship with Jesus, in our submission to God, this decenteredness looks like what 16th century reformer and theologian Martin Luther wrote. You are so cemented to Christ that he and you are as one person which cannot be separated but remains attached to him forever. One person, one mind, one heart, one soul, not two. No double-mindedness, no daisukos, no double-souled. You see, submission, and how, how are we doing? I know that word submission is, is a little tough. We doing all right still? Submission, this concept is, 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 is difficult to put into action. And it even has a very negative connotation in our culture today because it is extremely difficult to admit for any of us, myself included, to admit that my life is not about me. It's not what I want. Not about my way. Instead, it's about learning to follow what God desires. And this, this is how I would define submission for us today. Submission is simply putting the wants and desires of someone else ahead of your own. And if we were to apply, the, apply this definition to God, it's simply putting the wants and desires of God ahead of our own. You see, this, this definition, this concept, there's a reason I included the word simply here because I think it is simple. But man, is this demanding. This is so demanding. Why is this? Well, I think it's because in 21st century America, individual, individualism is a lie that we have bought into. For anyone who's, who's taken a basic philosophy course and you've studied Rene Descartes at least a little bit and you know that he said, I think, therefore I am. And we as a culture have agreed with that. Like, yeah, that's all that I can really be sure of. The only thing I can trust, the only thing I know is that I exist. But the issue is that we, when we approach life this way, the only thing that ends up mattering is me. What I can control, my power, my authority, but submission Submission takes on a different posture. Submission says, hey, my, my life is not about me. My life is actually under the authority of God. It's, what, it's about what God wants and, and what God desires. And, and here's, here's the crazy part about this. When we understand this, when we, when we really take this to heart, when our life is driven and motivated by this, this is where it really begins to take shape in our life. Lean in here with me. This is important. This is how we can take submitting to God even further. This is, what, this is what happens. This is what God shows us when we submit our ways to him, especially in light of any quarrels or disagreements or arguments or relational conflict we have. If we've learned anything about God, then we know exactly what God is about. God is about love. It's, it's what defines him. And if we submit to God, then this is what submission to God produces in us for God and for those around us. This is how it manifests itself in our lives. When we submit to God, we submit to others. When we put God's desires ahead of our own, we begin to put other people's wants and desires before ours. And when we do this, check this out. When we do this, it is really difficult to hurt those we love. It's why anyone who ever asks me for relationship advice, the first thing I recommend is to stop compromising so much which sounds like terrible advice. Like anyone who's ever listened to an expert on relationships is like, no, that's one of the main things they say, like give and take. But instead I say, you know what? Compromise isn't any good. You know what's great is collaboration. Actually, if you can take collaboration one step further and if you can both be predisposed to naturally surrender to one another, if you can, if you can choose to put the wants and desires of the other person first, both people will win. No one loses if you try to outgive and outserve one another in every relationship. 
You know, I, I have a friend who, who would hate it if I said his name, so I'm not going to, but he is constantly trying to figure out how he can put my wants and desires ahead of his in our friendship. He's doing this so much that it's actually kind of annoying. And, and, I, and I've started to figure out, I'm like, man, I'm gonna beat you in this. Like, I'm trying to figure out how I can win at putting his wants and desires ahead of mine. And now that I think about it, he might be a genius because I don't even argue with him anymore. You know, but I don't, I don't think he's that manipulative. But I do think he's that loving. I mean, do you have a person like that in your life? Someone who's so focused on what you want, on what your desires are, someone who loves you so much that you can't help but return the gesture. You see, that's what this whole concept is, is centered around. I mean, why do you think that James, the brother of Jesus, is telling the church to submit to God? His answer is, hey, when conflicts and quarrels and arguments and fights arise, here's my answer, submit to God. Submit to God. He doesn't say, hey, here's, here's your five steps to have a better relationship with that person. He says, submit to God. And the reason he does this is because his brother consistently and constantly communicated that the most important thing is to love God by loving others. When you submit to God, you submit to other people. See, this is what I'm trying to implement as my, my next step with Jesus in my life right now. Like I alluded to earlier, uh, I struggle with this idea of submission. Like I really, I'm, I'm ter terrible at this. Like this whole week as I've been studying and preparing, I'm like, God, why did you choose me to teach this sermon? And then I called my, my mom's mom, my grandmother uh, yesterday because it was her birthday and my aunt was with her and she's like, what are you preaching this weekend, Steve? And I said, submission. And she's like, why did they choose you? <laughs> I don't know, Aunt Lisa. I see you once a year. Thanks for being, God, I have so many encouraging people in my life. Um, no, but, but seriously, I want my way. For all of you Enneagram people out there, I, I'm an eight. Like I, I, wanna, I wanna challenge those around me. And, and, and ultimately, I, I just desire authority. That's who I am. And too often, and I know that the, the negative ramifications that this has in relationships, trust me, too often I look past those around me to see how I can get control and how I can get my way. Just to be completely honest with you. But what I'm, what I'm learning, and, and, and maybe God can, can, this resonates with you and this will be helpful for you, what I'm learning is in the midst of my desire to argue or quarrel, when those things arise, I'm learning to stop and take a moment and ask God, what is that person's desire in this situation? I'm asking God to open my eyes to the wants of those I come in contact with so that I can, and this is crazy, and I don't even necessarily love saying it because then I'm accountable to it, but intentionally and purposefully submitting to other people to put their wants and desires ahead of my own. And I encourage you to join me in this venture, but fair, fair warning, what I'm learning is exactly what I said a moment ago. Submission as a concept is so simple, but it is so demanding. You know, one of, the, one of the best examples of submission that we have in scripture is, marri is marriage. And if you're not married, um, don't check out during this part because I, I think this does not exclude you. I would actually say that this is a great part for, for any relationship. It's applicable to all of us. But there is a reason why Jesus' relationship with the church is given the metaphor of marriage in scripture. And actually the passage this comes from is not the most popular text in the Bible. It's written by the Apostle Paul when he implores wives to submit to their husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, just so we're clear, right after that, Paul tells husbands to lay down their lives for their wives just as Christ did for the church, or more simply put, husbands submit. Um, but the verse before the wives submit verse is often missed. For some reason, when we talk about marriages or relationships, we, we miss out Ephesians 5, on Ephesians 5.21. Paul wrote, submit to one another... Submit to one another, mutually submit out of reverence for Christ. Paul's saying out of your reverence, out of your awe, within your worship for Jesus, mutually put one another's wants and desires ahead of your own. Think about the magnitude of this with me real quick. I mean, there are some far-reaching implications to this verse written by Paul. Can you think of any marital conflict that could not be solved with this approach? 
but let's not make this just about marriages. Can you think of any friendship or parenting or relational conflict that could not be solved with this approach of mutual submission? See, when we fight and when we argue, we are trying to win. But what if we took a cue from James and a cue from Paul? And instead of trying to win to get our way, whatever the relationship is, what if we submitted ourselves to God and consequently one another? And an even crazier thought, what if in our relationships with one another, we went as far as, as to see who could put the needs, wants, and desires of the other person ahead more? Like instead of a, a competition to see who could win the argument, what if we had a submission competition? Like it's essentially what my friend is doing with me. I mean, I just want to win at submitting. It's genius, like I said, he's so smart. Now, real quick, before we move on, I just gotta take, I wanna make a quick, quick side note because I wanna be clear on something. Um, I, I hope you hear what I'm saying here, that submission, when it's mutual, is best. Let's remember that James is writing to people who are part of the church and they're learning to submit to God's ways together. Anytime we read uh, brothers and sisters in James' is writing, it's, it's, it can be better translated to believers, those, are, those that are on the inside, people who are already part of the church. Um, if you felt tension during this conversation because you've tried to posture yourself in the way of submission to someone else and they have taken advantage of that to the point that it has led to an abusive relationship, then let me be clear. I am not advocating for and will not, con will not ask you to continue to submit to that person. You are not being loved. You are not being treated like an image bearer of our heavenly father and that is never okay. The submission I'm talking about today is a way to grow in relationships where both people have a desire for health and a desire to honor God. And if you've experienced anything like what I just, what I just mentioned, first of all, our care team would, on any of our campuses would love to walk alongside you with your journey and, and, and help you get the, the help you need and, and figure out how we can be there for you. That, that's what the church is for. But, but secondly, I am so sorry that that's been your experience. And I hope that we as a church can, can come alongside you and help you heal. So I just wanna make sure we're clear on that. Submission is healthiest when it is mutual. Okay, earlier I, I said something that, that I hope you caught and I wanna close by restating it. Um, and, and, it's, and it's this statement. As soon as I admit that there is something wrong in me, I lose all of my leverage. Now, why do we care if we lose leverage? Because if we lose leverage, we lose. We don't get our way as soon as control and power go away. Saying I was wrong is no way to win an argument. But think with me really quick about Jesus' time on earth. And let's remember that if any human being could have ever leveraged his authority to demand allegiance and obedience, it was the human being who was also 100% God. He had a divine right to require those he came in contact with to do things his way. But he didn't use those things to communicate his desire for people's lives, did he? No. What did Jesus leverage? He leveraged his example of love, sacrifice, and submission. He commanded them and motivated them, not through his authority, but through his love. Th think about how crazy and backwards this is. Jesus Christ stepped into victory through his surrender. You see, submission to God and submission to those around us out of reverence for Christ is so valuable. It's so loving. It's so victorious. And it's so much like Jesus. Listen to what Paul writes to the Philippian church. He says, in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God, listen to this, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, what did Jesus do? He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Submit yourselves to one another just as Christ submitted himself to us to pay the penalty for our sin. Take on this mindset. Let this be the one thing we are focused on. No double-mindedness, no split souls, no more trying to get our way. 
And last week I had a chance to talk to my grandfather and my grandpa is an incredible man whose life is marked by submission to God and submission to other people. And I'm learning, every time I talk to him, I learn so much from him. Um, his wife, my grandmother, went to be with Jesus two years ago and his stories about her are my favorite. They had a great relationship, such a, such a model to look to. But my, my grandfather and I were talking about some of the some of the decision-making process that he and my grandma went through. And, and he said, you know what, Steve? The interesting thing is that any time we disagreed and I pushed to get my way, any time I asserted my will and I was wrong, which is something that happens to Ingold men a lot when we really try to push to get our way. He said, any time I was wrong, you know what your grandma never said to me? Not one time did she ever say, I told you so. See, at the end of the conversation, my grandpa said something so interesting, like, I'll never forget this. But it came with some sadness that I don't usually catch from my grandpa. He is a very joyful man. He said, you know, Steve, I just wish I would have listened to her more. Nowadays, my grandpa doesn't care about whether or not he got his way or whether he won an argument. The one thing he wishes that he could have done is listened to or submitted to my grandmother even more. He doesn't regret, regret not getting his way enough. He doesn't regret losing arguments. He just wishes he could have put her wants and her desires ahead of his own more than he did. My, grand, my grandfather, in all of his wisdom, in all of his life experience has learned, and this is something that I believe with every, every part of me, and something that I, can, that I hope you can hold on today. Submission is the most transformative and beneficial relational dyna dynamic that exists. And I believe this is true of our, of our relationship with God and our relationship with others. In this text, James implores the church to put God's desires ahead of our own. And, and as we take a closer look at this and we understand the implications of this, we realize that God moves us toward putting others' desires before ours. He's showing us the way of Jesus, submission. And just so you know, this is not comfortable. If it were comfortable, if, if, you, if you think you're submitting and it's comfortable, you're probably not submitting. It's not easy because giving away control pushes against every fiber of our being. It's not fair, but we have to remember that we are submitting to the God who didn't spare his perfect son in order to pay the ransom for our souls. But I will tell you this, it is so worth it because I do not know of a more powerful, life-changing, conflict-squashing, victory-yielding action in the history of the world than submission, simply putting the wants and desires of someone else ahead of my own. That those we love the most would no longer be those we hurt the worst. But instead, they would see the kindness, compassion, and love that, th that flows from our Father through us as we submit to Him. Let's pray. Father God, I know that, that there are times where I get up here to talk in front of people and Father, I'm fully aware of the accountability that, that, that you give me when I say the words that I say, but I'm sure you chuckle when you see who's giving some of these messages. Because God, I, I will admit that I am on a journey to learn what it means to put other people's wants and desires ahead of my own, God, and to be completely honest, and you know this, your desires ahead of my own. But Father, I ask that as I go along this journey that you continue to refine me, and God, with, for anyone else here that might be like me, God, that you would continue to refine them as well. Father, that we would go on this journey together, that all quarreling and relational conflict, any pride, boast, boastful, boastful nature, arrogance, anything, God, that we're dealing with, that would cause us to elevate ourselves above someone else, God, that you would just get rid of that. Because, Father, we want nothing more than to follow the example that you provided, that your son laid down his life that you sent him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we, God, that we might become the righteousness of God. Father, we glorify you and honor you and worship you and praise you. And God, we don't want that to stop here. 
Let us submit to you this week. Surrender our will and submit to those around us that they might see the thing that defines you most, your love. Pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen.